Hello friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Also, welcome to this really messy background. I'm in the middle of moving and organizing my bookshelf. So we're just dealing with this until Friday. But anyway, we're here because the Goodreads Choice Awards has gone up and I've never actually taken on the challenge. But this year I decided I'm gonna try. And when I clicked in today, when I logged into Goodreads, I saw that they now have a romanticy category, which is really exciting. Although I already see the preview of it. I haven't clicked in to see what the fantasy wrecks are, even though it shows you like a little preview so I see three of them. In the romanticy one they have the Jassad Air that is not a fantasy romance. I don't know why it keeps getting categorized as a fantasy romance. It does not have any romance in the first book. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway it's there but I do think it's really exciting that they have a romanticy section. Okay so in terms of what I think is going to make the fantasy genre things have shifted in my brain a little bit because of the romanticy category because I was like yeah fourth wing absolutely going to be there but it's probably going to be in the romanticy category now. I also would have said the Jassad Air but it's in the romanticy category. So I do think that the book that wouldn't burn is going to be there by Mark Lawrence. I think something like Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies is going to be there. Amina Al Sarafi because the David Bot trilogy was such a popular series. I'm sure Hellbent will be there um, simply because Ninth House won one year. Was it in 2018 or 19? It won the Goodreads Choice Awards. I also think Fragile Threads of Power will be there simply because it's V.E. Schwab and I think she's always in the category if she is published that year. And then similarly, Brandon Sanderson, one of his books, one of his secret books will be in there. I don't quite remember when everything published for Brandon Sanderson, so I I'm assuming that Trust of the Emerald Sea is probably the one that could be nominated because it came out in the beginning of the year. So it feels like that would probably be the one that makes it. I definitely think that Cassandra Clare will make it onto this list because she is a beloved YA author. And so she just released her adult debut. She released it in time to be put in this category. So I feel like she has a strong possibility of being here. And then lastly, the only one that I thought of that would definitely make it is a Day of Fallen Night, is that what's called by Samantha Shannon, simply because Priory of the Orange Tree was everywhere when it published and people were very excited about this prequel. So I definitely think it'll be in the long list, but let's see what actually made it to the long list. Okay, I'm actually surprised by some of these. Okay, so Starling House, has made it, which is interesting to me because I figured that that was like in the horror category, if not just in the fiction category, but it's interesting that it's in fantasy. A Day of Fallen Night is here. Ink Blood Sister Scribe. This came out probably midway through this year and it was something that I was slightly interested in. It's like a witchy book, so that's cool. Okay, so we have a lot of the Greek retellings, which I, I don't ever really know why they're in this category, but we have Clymestra, Atlanta and Stone Blind. I think those are all Greek retellings. Um, I'm never really that interested in Greek retellings. They're not my thing, but they have made it to the long list. <laughs> oh, The Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshani Tchotchke. I should have known because Roshani Tchotchke is also one of those authors that kind of always makes it to the long list and she's very prolific and her prose is very purpley and beautiful. So I can see this one. I haven't had the best of luck with her, but I am slightly interested in this one. Okay, so Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies is on here. Venko by Sherry Dimeline. This is another one that I'm surprised it's not in the horror or fiction category. Okay, so we have The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi. We have Swordcatcher by Cassandra Clare. Oh, Bookshops and Bone Dust. I think Legends and Lattes made it last year to the long list, if not the top 10. And I'm surprised that this is on here. The Witch King by Martha Wells. I didn't even think about this. I ended up DNFing this. So I don't know. I don't know if this one has been well received, but Martha Wells, obviously a very prolific sci-fi and fantasy writer. The book that wouldn't burn. I figured Mark Lawrence would be on here because he has some very popular series. They're a little bit older at this point, but this one just gives me Starless Sea vibes. So um, I really, I'm gonna read it regardless. Victory City, I have seen this cover because I kept saying to Jared that I thought it was a really pretty cover, but I didn't know that this was fantasy. I always see it in the fiction section, but I see that we're noticing a theme here. Um, the Will of the Many. I should have thought of this. Okay, the reason that I didn't think this book would be on the long list, because I'd never heard too much about James Islington's other series until I got onto booktube, and now it's on my TBR and I really wanna read it. But I just didn't think it would be on the long list because I actually haven't heard that much about The Will of the Many, but I am excited because I own this book and I've been really excited to read it. Fragile Thrones of Power is on here. I have read it. Um, I, 
it's it was fine. I think it's interesting because it's the start of a new series, but you definitely have to read the first three to understand what's happening in the series. So that kind of sucks. The Unmaking of June Pharaoh by Adrienne Young. Okay, yeah, she, I think she also made it last year for Spells for Forgetting or the year before. Um, I just did not think, I thought it would be in like the fiction category. Hellbent is here. That makes sense to me. And Trust of the Emerald Sea. So that makes sense because I do think it was the first one published of his secret project. So it's the most read. Okay, so I will get back to you whenever I've gathered all of the books. Some of them I own, some of them I'm going to need to get from the library. And some of them I'm just going to be getting the audiobooks. <laughs> so I got the stack of books. There's still more. So this is the stack. Some of them are the ones that I'm predicting are in the top 10. Some of them like Bookshops and Bone Dust. They're just in the top 20. They have the potential of being in the top 10, but maybe I didn't predict it. So I just kind of gathered as many of the books as I possibly could because there's a potential that I will be reading things that obviously I didn't predict. But I have all the books. The only ones I don't have are like The Unmaking of June Farrow, Starling House, and Hellbent. And then the Greek retellings, I'm just throwing one up to the big one upstairs hoping that it doesn't happen because I don't really enjoy Greek retellings very much. That being said, I actually need to give you some reviews because there have been some books on this list that I'm like 100% sure, we'll go with 99.9% .9 sure, that they are gonna make it to the top 10. One of the books that I first wanna talk about, I actually didn't finish this. This was the DNF. I am not gonna be reviewing it because I'm actually gonna be trying to reread it and that was Tress of the Emerald Sea. There was something about this when I first picked it up that I was just not vibing with. I don't know if it was the writing style because this is more whimsical, which is different for Brandon Sanderson. He typically doesn't do whimsy, but he wrote this book for his wife. It's supposed to be like whimsical fairy tale vibes. So I do want to try again because I have high hope for it. I just feel like I wasn't in the mood or the right headspace for this, which happens to me. That's the type of reader I am, unfortunately. So I want to give this another shot. I've also read Hellbent and sadly Hellbent was one of my worst books. I think of last year. Did I read it last year? Or did I read it this year? When did I read it? <laughs> no, it came out this year, didn't it? Either way, I ended up giving it a 2.5 stars. This is not surprising and this is my own fault, if I'm honest with you, because I should have known. I didn't love Ninth House. I gave it like a three stars, maybe generously a 3.5. I wanted to love Ninth House so badly and there were parts of it that I did really love which was why I was kind of interested in moving on. I really fell victim to the hype and I ended up picking up Hellbent despite my better judgment. Because with Ninth House the ending was my biggest problem with the book. Why did we have three twists? I didn't need that. I didn't need it. Also, why are we focusing on Alex, the most mundane character of the bunch? So I absolutely should have known to not move on with Hellbent. Shockingly enough though, with Hellbent, the ending was the most redeemable part to me because I was so excited about how it ended and it almost made me want to go into the third book, but there's no way I'm doing that. And honestly, you can memorialize this clip and show it to me whenever I tell you that I'm gonna try to read the third Ninth House book, whatever that may be. What is this series even called? There were so many moments in Hellbent for me personally, okay? If you loved it, this is not me saying that you have bad taste, okay? But for me personally, it was so unserious. There was not a serious moment to be found. What were we doing? Also, I genuinely feel like this series would be so much better if it were from Darlington's POV, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, let me tell you what Ninth House is about since Hellbent is the second book. I can't really give you the synopsis of it, but Ninth House is basically a dark academia. It's set at Yale and we are following our main character, Alex, and Alex is kind of an undercover Yale student. She didn't get into Yale by any means, but she can see ghosts. So they have admitted her into Yale because they think there are some nefarious things happening in the secret societies at Yale, which are very real and very prevalent and so they have her coming and watching the ghosts and seeing how the ghosts are acting and seeing if any of these secret societies are doing things that they shouldn't be. In the midst of this, there is a woman who is found dead and Alex gets really obsessed with this case and she feels like it's tied to the secret societies in some way. She's not sure how, but she's gonna figure it out. So we have a lot of amateur sleuthing and it's really like this murder mystery with some ghosts involved. I liked the ghost aspect in Ninth House. I thought that was like 
like the coolest part. If I'm honest with you, I think that Ninth House was my first time ever reading Dark Academia. And I've noticed a few things, like a trend in Dark Academia, because I have done two videos now where I have read various Dark Academia books to figure out if I like the genre. And in both of those videos, I have very mixed results. But one of the things that I have gotten out of those videos is that Dark Academia is very much about a murder mystery. And it's about characters who are morally gray, figuring out a mystery potentially involved in the murder itself. And so this follows those same conventions, but because I wasn't super familiar with the Dark Academia, I didn't realize that was kind of one of the formulas, one of the givens with the Dark Academia. I don't like amateur sleuthing. It's really only something I can enjoy in like cozy mysteries, but in serious mysteries, I don't generally like an amateur sleuth. So going into Hellbent, we still had situations where Alex was acting as an amateur sleuth, which whatever, I kind of expected it. But now we're adding in a lot more paranormal and a lot more horror into this book and it just didn't work for me that well. Like I said, a lot of unserious moments. So I ended up giving this a 2.5 stars. I'm not gonna lie, I'm also a little bit confused about why this one landed in the fantasy category versus the horror category because in my mind, Hellbent is a horror. The only justification I can give to it being in fantasy is that Ninth House was in the fantasy category, and I believe it won a few years ago in the fantasy category. So maybe for continuity's sake, it's staying in fantasy, but to me, it reads like a horror. I also read Fragile Threads of Power, which is the beginning of a new series in the Darker Shades of Magic world. But this is supposedly following new characters. It's not really, and it's the start of a new adventure. But I always feel now that I have to give a heavy disclaimer about this series. While it is the start of a new adventure, you very much need to read the previous trilogy, the Shades of Magic trilogy, before reading this series, unless you want to be very confused about character dynamics and some of the world building, if not like most of the world building. There are a few new aspects to the world building that we have never seen before in this book, but otherwise it's going to be extremely confusing. I actually can't imagine having read the first trilogy and not rereading it because I had read it so long ago. I would have been so confused about so much of the world building in here, especially Especially because my major complaint about the Shades of Magic trilogy is that the world building does have some plot holes and maybe she was leaving those holes in so that they could be filled in by this series. But again, that would mean that this is not a series that you can just successfully dive into and understand it. We do at some point in this book start to focus on two new characters, but for the most part, the beginning probably half of this book is very much focused on old characters and it's almost like this 30, 40, 50% goodbye to these characters where they're about to become background characters and our new characters Tess and Kosika are about to take over more of the plot but it just felt like a weird setup. It was a very weird setup. I ended up giving this three stars. I was very disappointed by this book. And honestly, my major complaint is just about the setup of this book. The writing is impeccable. I feel like V.E. Schwab, if you already like V.E. Schwab's writing, if you like her storytelling style, you're going to love this. The world building is a lot more fun in this one. I like a lot of the additions in this book to our magic system, to our world building, and I liked the two new characters. I just wish they were the forefront of the book. I will be moving forward with this series. I'm just not highly anticipating it the way that I was with this book. And then lastly, I also have read The Adventures of Mina al Sarafi, which I loved. This is hands down my favorite of the books that I've read so far. I ended up reading this a 4.5 stars. I loved the Dave Abad trilogy, so I was highly anticipating this book and it didn't disappoint. One of the things I was really looking forward to is the fact that this is a seafaring book. Our main character was middle-aged, so all of those elements were already very exciting for me and then I started the book. So basically our main character Character is Amina al Sarafi, and she has been a pirate for many years, but she went into retirement after having a child. Well, somebody comes into the picture who knows of her background and kind of has something that she could blackmail Amina with, but mostly she offers Amina a large sum of money, so much so that she would never have to worry about finances for her and her child ever again. So she decides to get the crew back together again and they go on this grand seafaring adventure. And I love it because Pirates of the Caribbean is one of those movies 
movies that I just loved growing up. I loved the piracy, I loved the humor and the adventure in it. So I've always been looking for pirate books that have a similar vibe. And I would say that this comes the closest. It's definitely not the same. So don't expect going into this that you're gonna be reading Pirates of the Caribbean. But I think it's the closest a book has ever come to being similar to Pirates of the Caribbean. And I really appreciated that. I had such a fun time. I love the narration. I highly, highly recommend the audiobook narration if you enjoy audiobooks. And this is a trilogy, so I'm very excited to see where the story is going. We're not necessarily left on a cliffhanger by any means, but we are definitely left with an open enough ending that I think the adventures will be really exciting and I'm hoping that the rest of the series is just as good. So this by far, if I'm ranking anything, this one's gonna be my number one, I feel. Unless something in the top 10 that I read ends up knocking this out, this will be my number one and will likely be the one that I vote for. But I mean, I am desperately hoping, like really desperately hoping to find another new fantasy book that even comes close to how I felt about Amina. I'll Sadafi. So hopefully the Goodreads Choice Awards changes that. That's probably far-fetched, but we'll see. Hi friends, we are in terrible lighting because it is 6.30 on Monday evening and the Goodreads Choice Awards top 10 nominees for fantasy have gone live. And before I get spoiled for anything, I just wanted to hop on and look at them. I feel like those Greek retellings, at least one or two of them have definitely made it. Okay, so the top row is exactly what I anticipated. So we have The Adventures of Amina al-Sarafi, we have Hellbent. Oh, Bookshops and Bone Dust. I don't think I put it in my top 10, but I definitely had a feeling that it would be in the top 10, simply because it was in the top 10 last year. That is solely what I was basing it off of. So I knew it had a really high likelihood of being in the top 10 and it's here. I did read this, so I'm ahead of the game. <laughs> Actually, the top four, I have read all of them. So Swordcatcher is here. I kind of anticipated this. Cassandra Clare has a huge fan base, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't have expected anything less. Okay, so the next row. Again, three of the books that I anticipated, one of them I absolutely did not anticipate making it into the top 10. I'm actually very shocked by this one. So the ones that I definitely anticipated being in the top 10 were Tress of the Emerald Sea, A Day of Fallen Night, Fragile Threads of Power, and then the surprising one is The Unmaking of June Pharaoh. This I did not expect. Who knows, maybe it's more fantastical than I'm assuming. And then the last two, I definitely predicted these two. So we have the Encyclopedia of Fairies and we have Starling House, which I figured Encyclopedia of Fairies would be there simply because it's been out probably the longest of all of these books, except maybe Amina al-Sarafi and Hellbent and it also has had a lot of readership. I've seen so many people on booktube reviewing it. So to be honest, I'm not that surprised by this list, except for the unmaking of June Farrell. The thing that's surprising for me though, is that, I don't know, for example, Bookshops and Bone Dust or The Unmaking of June Pharaoh wasn't replaced with a Greek retelling. I feel like every year we have a Greek retelling in the fantasy section. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm kind of happy that there isn't a Greek retelling in the fantasy section because arguably I don't know that it belongs in the fantasy section. Maybe it does, I don't really know. But it is interesting that books like Starling House and The Unmaking of June Pharaoh are in the fantasy section. That being said, I have read one, two, three, four five, six of these books already, which means I only have to read four more. <laughs> Although A Day of Fallen Night is so big, I was kind of hoping it would make it because of how big it is. Cool, so we have four more books to read and one of them is huge, so exciting. <laughs> So this is the first book that I picked up for the Goodreads nominees. This is the one that I'm predicting is gonna be in the top 10. So I started it and I am just at the 50% mark. And here's the thing. I loved Legends and Lattes. It was one of my favorite cozy books that I read last year. I was very excited when Travis Baldry announced that there was gonna be more in this series. And I didn't expect that it was gonna be a prequel. So this is a prequel to Legends and Lattes. I suppose it would be a better experience to read this 
this first and then go into Legends and Lattes because this is about Viv's backstory and Viv is our main character in Legends and Lattes. She's our main character in Bookshops and Bone Dust. But in this prequel, we're learning about why Viv retired from being a mercenary. So we learned in the prologue that she severely breaks her leg and she ends up having to go to the small town to recover and she's unable to do mercenary work. And you see her feel really uncomfortable with this idea of not being able to do mercenary work. She feels bored. She feels like the small town isn't for her. She likes a really exciting life. And then she ends up meeting Fern and Fern owns a bookstore and Fern kind of gets her into reading. There is a bit of a mystery in here as well. There is this gray man. At like 30% we started getting into this mystery, but so far it's really about Viv struggling with her recovery process of not being a mercenary and then falling in love with reading. And let me tell you, it's cute. It's cute. I love Viv. I loved Viv in Legends and Lattes. I really love Fern as a character. I love the concept of somebody falling in love with reading for the first time. It actually makes me feel really, really nostalgic. But unfortunately for me, this book is very forgettable. It's very easy to put down. And if I put it down, I wouldn't be upset if I never picked it back up type of thing. Like it's very cute when I'm reading it. And I feel those nostalgic feelings of like falling in love with reading for the first time, especially as an adult, because I myself as an adult, fell back in love with reading after college and it was a really fun experience and it brought me to booktube so I really I enjoy that part of it but everything else is just like fine and I'm kind of wondering if this should have been a novella like a little novella that came before if you wanted to read this before Legends and Lattes you could and the thing is is I completely understand that this is supposed to be low stakes because that's the whole point of this series in general that was the whole point of Legends and Lattes but I think there was just something really fun about Legends and Lattes with the building of the cafe, with Viv getting to know these new characters and this new life for herself. And here it's similar. It's actually very similar because she is learning new things about herself. She's having to rebuild her life once again. So those things are very reminiscent of one another in both of these books. Obviously we have really cute side characters. I love Fern. I just think I would love to get a book from somebody else's perspective in here. Like I know this is a prequel and there are going to be more in the series that are not prequels, but I would love to have a different perspective. But yeah, I mean, I'm only, you know, just at the 50% mark. So maybe the latter half of this will be a little more interesting and I will end up liking it more. But right now it's kind of sitting at a three stars for me, which really sucks because this was a five star prediction. Hello, friends. I finished. I finished Bookshops and Bone Dust. I almost said something completely different. Anyway, I finished Bookshops and Bone Dust. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's like a three, 3.5, probably just a three stars. It was fine. <laughs> I think it's because the stakes of this book feel very low since we already know where Viv's story is gonna go. It was hard for me to feel invested in certain characters in here simply because I know Viv's story. So honestly, I highly, highly recommend that if you have not read Legends and lattes read this first and then read legends and lattes because i think that you would have a much better time i definitely think that the second half of this book is much stronger than the first half for me personally there were a few characters that were introduced probably at the 20 to 30 percent mark that made this a much stronger second half and much like legends and lattes there are some high stakes even though it's not the highest of stakes there are some high stakes that make you a little on edge and make it a little more exciting than just a low stakes fantasy that's simply cozy. But you know, I love Viv. I love this world. I like the cozy feeling that it gives me. I like the writing style. It's all there. It's just, it was so hard to be invested in the characters when I already knew where this was going. There was only one character where I was excited to meet and I'm excited that this character is one that we will get to know in the future and see more interactions with but ultimately this was very just slow and kind of boring for parts of it and then other parts it was very much a why should I care because I already know where this is going. I really 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 wish that this came out first. I think this book came out simply to set up a specific character that we're gonna see later on in the series. And that's fine, but I just wish it would have come first. As always, the audiobook is a great time. Travis Baldry narrates it. If you didn't know, he is by trade a audiobook narrator or just a voice actor in general. And so he narrates both Legends and Lattes and Bookshops and Bone Dust. I'm sure he'll narrate the rest of the series, however many that will be. And I'll definitely read the next one in this series, but I'm less anticipatory 
summary of it. I think if I had to rank this based off what I've read already, which isn't very much, it would land distinctly in the middle because it just feels like I liked it enough, but I didn't love it enough for it to be in like the top five. So I think it would be in the sixth spot at this point, but I hope that other people love this. I really do. I hope that it is just as pleasant of an experience as reading Legends and Lattes is for other people. And again, if you have not read Legends and Lattes yet, you haven't picked it up yet, I would pick this up first. Hello friends, as you can see, we've made progress on my bookshelves. So it's not as messy in the background, but I'm here to update you because I am halfway through Swordcatcher by Cassandra Clare. And I'm having such mixed feelings about this because on the one hand, I was having a really good time. And now the pacing has gotten to a place where I'm like, okay, I would really love something more to happen. The thing about me and Cassandra Clare is I've never been able to get into any of her series. I just came into them, I think a little too late in life. And so they don't carry the same kind of nostalgia or excitement for me as other YA series do. And so I just never really gotten into any of her books. So honestly, I was going into this really hesitant, although I was very excited that she was writing an adult novel and it wasn't in the Shadowhunter series because that is the other thing that has stopped me from wanting to read anything else by Cassandra Clare because it's all in the Shadowhunters world. So suffice it to say, I was very excited that this was not in the Shadowhunters world. And here's the thing, I always know that when a YA author has their adult debut, there is a chance that things are going to read younger. And I kind of feel that here. There have been some moments where she's definitely trying to show you that they're older characters and that this is an adult novel. But so far, it does still read YA to me. That's not really bothering me. As a matter of fact, I'm really enjoying the writing in here. I'm enjoying it a lot. The prologue, which I think is like 30 something pages, was very, very interesting. And it immediately sucked me in. And I was like, wow, I could potentially see myself giving this a high rating and really, really enjoying it. And it's not to say that I'm not enjoying it anymore. The pacing is so slow. I feel like we haven't gotten anywhere. And the reveals that we've had, or the things that are pushing the plot forward, it's kind of like, okay, we got it, we we understand, we're established, we have this foundation, let's move forward into something else. And I'm at a point where I'm a little bit bored because I feel that the pacing is too slow and I'm not quite sure where this is going, which is to say I'm a little concerned that it's not going anywhere exciting. It's not going anywhere that's gonna make me want to go into the second book. But basically we have two POVs. Our first POV is Kel and Kel is what they call a sword catcher. So when he was a young child, he was orphaned. And because of his orphan status, he was stolen from any life that he knew. And he was taken in by the king and the queen to basically be a body double for the heir who is Prince Connor. And this only happens every time a king and a queen only have one son and that is their only heir to the throne. They bring in a sword catcher to make sure that there is no threat to the prince's life. So Kel has lost his identity through this, if he ever really had one. I believe he was only like 12 years old when they took him. So this is really the only steady life that he's ever known. And the thing is, is him and Prince Connor are actually very close. They are, as you would assume, like brothers. And you see that in the way that they interact with each other. And you actually see that very early on. When Kel is taken to Connor, Connor basically says to him, like, are you willing to give up your life for this? Because I only really want a sword catcher who is willing to be my body double. And so their relationship becomes much different in that moment because Kel is realizing that like, oh, maybe I do have a choice in this, although he doesn't really. Like, I, I don't really think that he had a choice in it, to be honest, but they're giving him the illusion of a choice. So in Kel's perspective, you are getting to see him interact with the nobles. You're getting to see him act as Connor and kind of what his life looks like outside of being a body double. So when he's not being the body double for the prince, he's often hanging out with him and acting as a bodyguard. So his whole life really is about the prince and anything having to do with his own pleasure, his own life, his own identity isn't really existent and he's starting to kind of notice this and have these moments of realizing that maybe he wants a little bit more out of life but doesn't really know how that's acceptable for him. Meanwhile the prince is kind of up to something and we're starting to sort of see that unravel. And then we have a secondary main character named Lynn and Lynn is not necessarily associated with Connor or Kel. She's a very gifted physician but she is also what they call in this world Ashkar and Ashkar is a small community 
of people who can still do magic. And by law, the Ashkar people have to live behind this walled community, and so they are separated from the rest of the community. What we know is that magic isn't really practiced anymore. We're not really sure why. Obviously, this is something that we learn along the way. But because of this law, as you can imagine, there's a lot of bigotry and hate and people being fearful of Ashkar people. You do see that in Lynn's POV because she is a physician. She gets to travel outside of those walls and help heal people. But you are seeing backhanded moments where there are people she is healed, but they won't give her access to information that she needs because of who she is. And this is a very interesting plot point because as, so far as I know in this book, we haven't had a huge explanation of the Ashkar people and why people fear them so much and why magic is so feared. We've seen hints of it. We've seen the bigotry. We've seen people talking about being fearful. We've had moments where Lynn and Kel actually have had interaction because there's an assassination attempt on the prince, which is obviously Kel. And so she comes in to heal him. And that's how their story interweaves, right? But it's interesting because they have a moment where Kel is like, like, I always thought that because you lived behind a walled community, it was very dangerous to go there. And she responds to that with saying, well, have you ever thought that maybe we were in a walled community because the world was dangerous to us? And it was like one of those basic moments of like, yeah, you guys are fearful of each other because of the way that you were raised and the bigotry that you were raised with. And obviously there's an oppressed community here and you've never seen it from each other's perspectives and we obviously have one character who's been raised in a very different way and has never seen anything from anyone else's perspective so yeah i guess the most interesting part so far has been this assassination attempt but that happened and then it really hasn't led to much of anything like we're kind of investigating some things but it's sort of just repetitive and a little bit boring at this point and I'm just having so many issues with the pacing. I'm hoping that the second half just like with Bookshops and Bone Dust picks up for me and I end up liking it more than I anticipated because of the second half. I'm just not sure and I don't know what to expect from Cassandra Clare because I haven't read Cassandra Clare but people love her so here's hoping that this is at least like a 3.5 four stars and maybe I'm compelled to move on with the rest of the series whenever it comes out. I don't know at this point but but we'll see. Hi, so I finished Swordcatcher. I'm gonna give this a three stars. I'm really disappointed because I thought I had a pretty good chance of giving this at least four stars, at least wanting to move on with the rest of the series. And I'm left with the feeling of just like, it was fine. I can't exactly pinpoint what didn't work for me other than the fact that it had a lot of pacing issues for me. And a lot of the reveals were very like womp womp. You know what I mean? Like every time something would be building up and we would then eventually get the reveal, I was like, oh, this isn't really as exciting as I wanted it to be. And the reveal isn't gonna lead us to anything new. If anything, many things in here felt very safe and also the characters felt very safe, which is an ironic statement considering some of the circumstances in this book and some of the things that actually happened to our main character, Kel. I think my other issue is that ultimately I didn't connect with these two main characters. I enjoyed them, I liked them for the most part, but I didn't connect with them the way that I connect with other characters and series that I end up loving. And I just don't know that I see myself connecting with these characters. I mean, I had like 500, almost 600 pages to try to connect with these characters and it just didn't really happen. I definitely like Lynn more as a main character than Kel. I felt like every time we were in Kel's POV, that's where I started to get much more bored. I think Lynn generally is a much more interesting character because A, her personality, I feel like she actually has a personality unlike Kel, so sorry. So yeah, she has a personality, but also she is a rare magic user and there's this intense history with her people and the fact that she is stuck behind these walls and she has grand dreams for herself, but also she's like in need of some forbidden knowledge. And I find her perspective to just be so much more interesting. The thing is, is I felt like we definitely didn't get her perspective as much as we get Kel's perspective. I'm sure there's purposes for that, especially with the way that this ended. I'm sure Lynn will become even more prevalent in her POV in the next book. But I definitely felt like this first book was so focused on Kel and Connor and their relationship 
relationship and the possibilities of Kel not being a sword catcher anymore and like what his life would look like, the freedom that he could obtain if he wasn't a sword catcher and the realization of the lack of autonomy that he has in his own life. Whereas before it was something that he felt was a privilege and the fact that he got to live with the royals and he was so close with Connor. And now there are things that are coming to light that are really confusing that and making him see things differently. And what's really funny about that is I typically am a lover, especially in fantasy, when a character is really set in a set of beliefs and then everything is turned upside down for them. And in theory, that happens here, but I guess because I'm not that connected to Kel and I think it's easy to see that he's being manipulated. I wasn't that invested in that portion of the book. It didn't hit me the way that it does in other fantasies. And this ends, you know, there is kind of like twisty turny stuff that does happen in the end, but it wasn't enough for me to be like, I immediately need book two. I don't even really think I would go into book two. Yeah, I just don't think I'm gonna be moving on with the series. I did not hate my time reading this. I was just bored for a majority of it. You know, I was really wishing things would pick up or that the twists that we were presented with would be a little bit more exciting or that at some point I would just feel really connected to the characters. None of that really happened for me, but I didn't hate my time. I really thought the writing was so strong in here. Based on what I've read in the past from Cassandra Clare, I definitely think her writing has improved so much. I just think that there's a lot of setting up of like romantic tension that I wasn't, you know, invested in and things like that. So it's hard for me to say like, oh, I hated this vehemently because of X, Y, and Z, or I loved it so much because of X, Y, and Z. Like it's just very middle of the road for me. Hello friends, so I don't actually have a copy of Trust of the Emerald Sea on me. Jared owns it, his books aren't unpacked, so we're just gonna pop up a picture. But I've been reading Trust of the Emerald Sea, I picked this up. You know from the beginning that I DNF'd this at like 70% last time, I just really was not enjoying the writing style. So I didn't have that high of hopes for this going into it a second time. I really wanted to give it another chance. And I'm not gonna lie, the first like 15 to 20%, I was concerned. I was very concerned for myself because I went into it with optimism. I was trying to be very optimistic despite my last feelings on it and it wasn't going well. I don't like the writing in here. I will say that right off the bat. The problem I find with this writing for me is that despite being somebody who does enjoy whimsy, I do enjoy whimsy. I do enjoy purple prose. This just wasn't working for me. It wasn't the type of whimsy or purple prose where I felt very connected to the story, to the characters, like I was on this adventure with them. I distinctly felt like I was reading a book. And in some ways I still feel that way. Once I hit the 30% mark, I definitely just started getting into the story more and I've been enjoying the adventurous parts of it, but I'm still slightly struggling with the writing. So Tress of the Emerald Sea follows our main character Tress and she lives on this island, which is basically a rock. She has never left this island. As a matter of fact, the people who inhabit this island are not allowed to leave the island and they are surrounded by an ocean. This ocean is unlike anything else you have ever seen because it is an ocean of spores and these spores are very deadly for humans. So Tess has grown up her whole life surrounded by silver and putting salt in her food and drinks because those things eliminate the dangers of spores. But one day when Tress's love of her life, Charlie, ends up going missing, she decides to go on this grand adventure across the ocean to try to save him. And so you are seeing these big adventures. She ends up on a pirate ship. She has to convince them to go to one of the deadliest parts of the ocean. And she makes friends along the way as well as talking animal companions. And listen, this in theory felt like perfection for me because I love a pirate story. I love seafaring stories so much. I love talking animal companions. And the funny thing is, is that's what's saving this book for me, but the writing style is just not my favorite. So this is actually told more uniquely than I imagine other Brandon Sanderson books are. I haven't read everything by Brandon Sanderson, but this is told from the perspective of a character named Hoyt. And you know Hoyt from the Stormlight Archives. I don't know how many other books you see Hoyt in within the Cosmere, because much like Robin Hobb, Brandon Sanderson's books, not all of them, but the majority of them are set in the Cosmere. So they're all interconnected in some way. Although I think they're on different planets and unlike Robin Hobb, you don't necessarily, from what I know, please don't quote me on this, you don't have to read things 
technically in a specific order to understand trilogies or series in his world, but they do have a lot of Easter eggs from what I know. So that being said, Tress is kind of one of those books that has a lot of Easter eggs from what I understand because it's pretty deep into the Cosmere. Oit, a character that you meet, again, I believe for the first time in Stormlight Archives, is the narrator of the story. I'm definitely interested in Hoyt, especially because I know that he is supposed to be modeled after the Fool from Robin Hobbs' Realm of the Elderlings, who is one of my favorite literary characters probably of all time. So in ways I do enjoy the whimsy, the humor, the adventure, and I do enjoy the fact that I think that Brandon Sanderson is having fun writing this book, which makes it a little more fun for you as the reader. At this point in time, I'm 70% in, and I can say at this point, it's not feeling like a new favorite book of all time, but I actually can see myself giving this four stars, which is shocking because I'm really enjoying the adventurous parts more than I anticipated. And I like the friendships that are being made between Tress and different people on the ship. And I will say, I love the animal companion in here. He's very funny. So when I first started this, I was like, oh no, this might be another DNF. But at this point, I could see myself giving this four stars. We'll see how it ends. I will admit that the second half of this was much better than the first half for me personally. I especially think once they get on the ship and you start to like get to know a lot of the characters who become key players in this book, it definitely becomes a lot more enjoyable because for me personally, the characters really made this story and actually one of my favorite characters was the animal companion in here. Huck was such a great character and when you find out his overall story and how he came to be, I really, really loved it. I definitely felt that the ending was very, very strong. My issue still remained with the writing. I'm not a fan of the writing. I did not like the choice of Hoyt telling this story. I still wish it were from the perspective of Tress or at least in third person. Overall, I'm really glad that I stuck with it because I do like Tress as a main character, hence why I wish it were from her POV. And I really liked a lot of the side characters and relationships that she made while on this journey to save Charlie, the love of her life. You could say that the way they save Charlie is a little bit cheesy, but I ended up really enjoying it. <laughs> still not 100% convinced that Brandon Sanderson should be doing whimsy, but I did have a lot of fun. This is not a new favorite book of all time. I think it's one of those books that like, I'm so glad that I read it and I enjoyed my time while reading it. But unfortunately, it's not something that I would want to reread really. And it's not something that I'm going to sit and think about all of the time. It was just a really fun time. I would say I'm teetering between a 3.5 and a four stars just because of how much I struggled through the beginning portion of this. So much so that the first time I read it, I DNF'd. Part of me wants to be generous and just give it a four stars based on how much I did enjoy the ending. But I think in my heart, it is a 3.5. I messed up one of my camera settings and now it like frames everything really weird. <laughs> anyway, you know that rule that if your cat is asleep on you, then you can't move. Well, that that's happening. You're not gonna be able to see him, but his little face is right here. Goose is sleeping on me. So we are gonna do an update about June Pharaoh right now, right here in this really poor lighting because if I don't talk about it now, I will forget about it. So basically that was my overall experience with this book is very forgettable. I literally just finished it. Like I gave myself 20 minutes to sit and ponder my feelings about this book. I think I read it over the course of two days. I read it majority of yesterday and then partially today. So this morning I finished it. And the thing is, I feel like this book had a lot of potential. It's hard for me to want to explain the premise of this book because I will say that the most pleasant surprise about this book was not knowing anything about it. But for the sake of giving you some context about this book. Um, basically, we have a main character named June Pharaoh, and she has been told her whole life that there's a family curse. And this family curse means that all of the women in the family start to go crazy. They start hearing voices and seeing things. And once that starts to happen, eventually they wither away and end up dying. This happens either rapidly or kind of slowly. We see at the beginning of the book that June Pharaoh's grandmother has gone through this for the last year and now has passed away. So it opens up at her funeral. But the problem is, is that that June doesn't know much about the curse and growing up hasn't really been told much about why this is potentially happening. Not long after the funeral, we actually find out that June has been hiding for the last year that she has started to hear things and see things out of the corner of her eyes. So she is under the impression that the unraveling of her memory and her potentially losing any grip on reality is coming rapidly. So throughout this book, there is like a sense of mystery. There's a mystery about what is happening to her. Why do all of the women have this curse? 
gifts, as well as there are a few things revealed to June through different characters that were close to her grandmother and close to her growing up that lead ultimately on this journey and kind of a murder mystery aspect to it. So I know that's a really bare bones synopsis. So I can kind of see why this was put in fantasy. I'll say though, I have such a hard time with books like this being put in the fantasy category. As we all know, the Goodreads Choice Awards is not the greatest, right? It's a fun thing that brings us together to discuss books and like we get to see what was popular in 2023. I think we're all aware that the Goodreads Choice Awards is just a popularity contest, right? Like we all complain about it every single year. Totally get that. I enjoy it because it's interesting to see what is popular among more than just the book community. The only thing that I struggle with is I think that categories have a lot of books in them that don't really fit. And one of the categories that often has books in them that I'm questioning why they're in that section is always fantasy. But with the Goodreads fantasy, I always wonder why there isn't more like epic fantasy. There's very rarely more than two epic fantasy books on the list. And that's especially when you narrow it down to the top 10. So it kind of sucks because I wish we would see more epic fantasy or at least like closer to epic fantasy within the fantasy genre alongside books like this. But this year, especially what I'm noticing being almost done reading all of these books, I feel that most of them just fall into their fantastical, but they're not necessarily fantasy. So going back to June Farrow, I feel like something I've been repeating this whole time is that pacing has been really off with a lot of these books. And I think especially for this book, to spend 30% leading up to this big reveal of what's happening to June was an interesting choice considering that you wanted to add in a murder mystery element to the book as well. And that mystery was solved literally within pages. Like it wasn't even a few chapters, it was pages. We get the backstory, we get the confrontation, and then that's that. And it was just very underwhelming. Even the ending was very underwhelming. I'm not even sure what I gleaned from that ending. I feel like it was too short for what it wanted to be. Plus we spent the first 30% trying to build up tension that didn't exist. Like what? We knew it was a time travel book. We all read the synopsis. And even if you didn't, it's fantasy. We know it's time travel. <laughs> I think the one element that I can say was done fairly well, and I really enjoyed it and I was fairly invested in it was the romantic element, <laughs> which is not surprising, but I was kind of invested in the romance subplot in here, um, but there was just too much going on, especially for the amount of pages that we had and the pacing. So I was just left feeling really underwhelmed and I don't have a ton of thoughts about this book because not much happens. Like, I think there are some interesting choices that are made in here in terms of the magic-ish system in here. Like we do get some insight into it. It's not like concrete into how it works. Our main character definitely tries to give us some understanding and clarity on the magic system. And so I will say that I was fairly interested in how that would pan out and how it worked in general. But I think with most time travels, like I try to just brush it off because you're never gonna get the answers that you want. Unlike concrete magic systems, these ones are very just loose and sort of don't need any defining, I guess, to have an enjoyable story. But we do get a little bit of clarity on some of the magic system, I will say that. So yeah, I think I'm giving this a three stars simply because there were some elements of it that I enjoyed. I'm not sure how I felt about the writing. I don't know if it was the narration because I did end up listening to this while I was doing chores around the house. I don't know if it was the narration or if there were just so many run-on sentences in this book, I don't know. I don't have a physical copy. I couldn't get it from the library. So yeah, I'm not sure if it was the narration or the writing was kind of clunky at times, but yeah, I think I'm giving it a three stars. Oh my God, I just realized I forgot to put lip gloss on. Give me one second. I'm a mess today. I am not feeling good. Um, chronic pain is such a bitch. <laughs> such a bitch like why is it like this anyway i am reading starling house i am in the middle of starling house i think i just hit 40 percent, and i'm a little frustrated because i think there's a romance that's gonna happen in here i'm also at a place in life where i'm like should i just stop reading haunted house books because i love the concept of a haunted house book it is my favorite horror trope out there but i have yet to read 
that many books with the haunted house trope that I actually love. So maybe it's not my favorite trope of all time. I just love the concept of it. I am a Casper girly through and through. So I love a haunted house. I love ghosts in houses. I love that concept so much. So that is what we have here. Starling House is a haunted house. There's a lot of rumors surrounding the family and the house itself. And our main character, Opal, she has been obsessed with the Starling House since she can remember. Opal's really hard on her luck right now. Her mom has passed away in an accident that we don't know that much about, but it's been hinted at a few times. So she has been left to take care of her brother. She's in this precarious situation of kind of being a mother figure to her brother who is still in high school. So she's looking for a better job. She has a really interesting, almost weird chance encounter with the Starling House Warden. I think it's Jasper. She has a weird encounter with Jasper. Let's just call him Jasper. And he ends up offering her a job to clean the Starling House and she takes it because she's obsessed with it and she wants to know what it's like inside and she wants to know its secrets, which ends up getting her wrapped up in a situation where there's this looming background figure who is really, really determined to find out about the Starling House and kind of take down the family in a way. And I think also condemn the house so that it's in her ownership. And so she's kind of harassing Opal to get information since Opal now has access to the house and no one has ever had access to the house outside of the family. So Opal is going back and forth about whether or not she wants to do it because it is a lot of money and she feels responsible for her brother. So she's like, you know what? I've spent my entire life not giving a shit about other people and not caring about the consequences of stealing because I just need to survive and I need to take care of my brother. But at the same time, she's growing attached to not only the house, but to presumably his name is Jasper. And like, this is not a spoiler because I don't know if it's going to end in a romance, but I just have this looming feeling that it's gonna end in a romance. And if that's the case, this is really gonna bring down the book for me. I'm also gonna be honest, I am really struggling with pacing with these books recently, like June Pharaoh and now this book. They are short books and the pacing has been so slow for such short books. And normally I don't need super fast pacing books but I feel like both June Pharaoh and Starling House have really focused on mundane things that haven't built up the plot for me personally maybe in Starling House this will pay off more in the end than it did for me in June Pharaoh but like the pacing is molasses you have 300 pages to convince me of the story and I'm confused about why we're here and so it's been kind of rough because I like the mystery and I like the mysterious aspects of the house but I don't really have any good or bad feelings about Opal I guess and I don't have any good or bad feelings about presumably his name is Jasper so I'm just struggling a little bit I'm enjoying it enough to where I want to keep listening, but I'm not like in love with it. And honestly, I kind of had the same feeling about once we were witches or once there were witches, which was Alexi e. Harrow's last major novel. And that one I gave like three or 3.5 stars for the same reason, except opposite in the sense that it was so long and I didn't understand why. So I really thought that Starling House would work for me because it seemed like the perfect size book for how Alex writes, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know. Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I'm the drama. I don't really know, but we'll see. It's shaping up to be another three stars, which how mundane, how mundane. Surprise, surprise. It's another three stars. <laughs> Also just very confused about why this is in the fantasy category. My mind can only reach for the fact that it's like fairy tale-ish and it seems to belong in horror, but like, that's just me. It's here in fantasy. I read it. A three star for me is not a bad rating, but it's one of those things that's like, I don't have enough to gush about because I enjoyed it fine. It was a solid story, but it wasn't anything that I'm like connected to. Characters probably didn't stand out to me. The story itself, probably well-written, but not like captivating enough. The plot, same thing. So it's like one of those books where it's like, I could sit here and tell you the synopsis, but like my feelings on it are so ambivalent. I think the only 
only conclusion I can come to about why this felt like three stars were a few things, one of which I'm not really gonna talk about because I don't wanna ruin that experience for you. But first and foremost, I felt like these characters were a vessel for us to learn about the house, to learn about Starling House and its history and why Starling House is the way that it is and the rumors surrounding it and the weird lore surrounding this house. Like these characters were vessels for us to understand that lore. And in theory, there's nothing wrong with that, but as a character driven reader, obviously that doesn't work well for me. Secondly, I think you were supposed to have some attachment to these characters based on where certain character arcs went and things that we learn about the past with a lot of these characters. Like I feel you were supposed to have some sort of attachment to them. And I had zero attachment to them. I thought they were fine characters, but they were really not memorable to me. So much so that I was calling one of the characters the wrong name. His name's not Jasper. It's Arthur. His name's Arthur. Jasper, on the other hand, is actually one of the more memorable characters. He is the brother of our main character, Opal. And I really liked him as a character. Again, was hard to get attached to him because he isn't really the main focal point of this and he's sort of used as a device for Opal being stagnant and being somebody that like steals and has no remorse for what she does because she's just trying to survive, rightfully so. Survive however you need to. But again, he was kind of just used as a character to like understand Opal, who was our arguably main character, even though Arthur is also kind of a main character. They were just both sadly very boring characters. They were not well enough developed or well fleshed out. They are literally vessels for you to understand the house. That on the other hand is probably the one thing I can gush about. I feel like the house, the lore surrounding the house and the vibes, like the gothic vibes and the kind of weirdness and creepiness of the house was really cool. And I really, really enjoyed the vibes of this book. And I really enjoyed how that plays out for the most part. But again, much like the unmaking of June Farrow, I feel like the pacing is all off. And arguably gothic books are supposed to be slower paced. It's like eerie, but there was not enough tension to make me feel like the pacing was justified in the first 30%. I will say the positive things about this, which I think kind of go hand in hand with the atmosphere of it all and like the gothic vibes. The writing was really on par with what I expected from Alexi e. Harrow. She's a very lyrical writer. She writes very beautiful sentences and I will not take that away from her in this book. I think that this was no different. It was just rough to get through this one and there is a specific plot point like I referenced in the beginning that I don't want to talk about because again, I don't want to ruin your experience but that really ruined my experience with this book. Felt very forced is all I'll say about it. But I really think it all comes down to the fact that like, because the characters are so integral to the rest of this plot, the fact that I didn't have any emotional investment in them makes it hard for me to overall enjoy this book. So I gave it a three stars. So another one down, buds, <laughs> another one down. I think I'm gonna have to DNF this. <laughs> I'm getting to a point in this book where I'm getting that like DNF feeling, which this happened to me in Priory of the Orange Tree. This is not surprising. Something about Samantha Shannon's fantasy worlds and her characters and the way that she writes them are just not intriguing for me. I wish I were the girls who loved Priory of the Orange Tree and subsequently also loved A Day of Fall and Night, but I feel like I might have to DNF this. I'm gonna give it a little bit longer, but I am not allowing myself to get 70% in like I did with Priory of the Orange Tree just for the sake of finishing a book. So that being said, this is a little frustrating because I'm not gonna lie, the first 50 to 70 pages were very interesting. I was especially enthralled by the prologue. I was very, very interested in, I believe it's three different queens. So you get Honora's story and these women all become like key players in the rest of the story. And this is a prequel to Priory of the Orange Tree. So this is setting up what I believe to be better world building. Honora's story was like my favorite of the three. And then we get Sabran's story, which Sabran's story was very interesting. And Sabran is a name that's continuously used within this family. And then we get Esbar's story. And I just really, really enjoyed the prologue because I think it set up these women and their families and their lineage really, really well. And then we get into chapter one, part one, which is called The Twilight Years. And this is in CE 509. So this is years and years prior to Priory of the Orange Tree. And we we are getting a lot of context, much like in Priory of the Orange Tree, about the East, the West, the South. And this is all in context to these women, so each of the women are from either the East, West, or the South. So at this point, I am at part two, and by the time we're getting into part two, I'm kind of asking myself, like, what fully is the point of this? 
<laughs> I mean, I know it's giving better context, but I think, you know, having DNF'd Prior of the Orange Tree, it's almost another scenario of like, why should I care? It's funny because this reminds me so much of what George R.R. R. Martin was doing with the Game of Thrones world, which is another series that I ended up DNFing a long time ago. It's so reminiscent for me. I think Samantha Shannon does it better in my opinion. I'm definitely not trying to compare the content or the quality of Game of Thrones and Prior of the Orange Tree. I think Samantha Shannon brings in a lot of diversity. There's sapphic relationships, and I just really appreciate what she's doing with her characters. There's a lot of focus on women and women in power. Very different in that context. But what I'm meaning is like if you enjoyed the pacing and you enjoyed those really complex family lines and complex familial bonds, I think that you'll enjoy Priory of the Orange Tree. I especially think that you'll enjoy A Day of Fallen Night if you are someone who really loves diving into the history of fantastical worlds that you enjoy, which I do in some context. But in here, since I've said it over and over again. Since Priory didn't work for me, this isn't as compelling for me or as interesting as I want it to be because I have no investment. So I am still going to try to give this a try, but I don't want to finish a book just for the sake of finishing a book because I do that too often and it needs to stop. It needs to stop. Okay, so I'm allowing myself a DNF. So yes, I will update you if I finish it or if I DNF it. Oh, the sliding is getting worse and worse. But hi, I started Emily Wilde's encyclopedia for fairies, of fairies, and I'm having a really decent time. I have hope for this because I really love Emily and I really love Wendell, and I think that their dynamic is like what makes this story so fun and so gripping for me. I just really, really enjoy their dynamic. I really love fae books. I love mythical creatures generally in fantasy, and so it is fun to have like this encyclopedia of fairies where she's teaching you about different fae, but I'm not that enthralled by it in this book. I more so care about the character dynamics, which is something I appreciate because I said before, I think actually in this vlog that characters are really important for me. Characters are something that I can really latch onto maybe when the pacing isn't going great or when the plot isn't plotting as much. Like characters can really hold it together for me. I think there's obviously a perfect mix for a book, right? There's the whole like we have great characters, we have great plot, we have a great magic system. And like that's in a perfect world. I find myself losing interest in books where they are super plot heavy and not heavy in the character development. And like, I don't mind if there is a plot heavy book as long as we have interesting characters to hold on to as well. Because I just love rooting for characters and I'm really feeling that in here. I'm definitely feeling that giddiness of like this relationship between Wendell and Emily and how she <laughs> is just so into her science and her studies of these Fae that she doesn't really recognize what's going on between her and Wendell. And Wendell is just so about being relaxed and cozy and happy and warm. And honestly, I relate to that. You know those little memes of frogs in the bed or the cats in the bed and it's like, I just wanna be cozy. That is Wendell, that is me, we are one that is us. Even though I'm not that engrossed or involved in her studies of Faye, I do really enjoy the plot that I think is unfolding with the Faye and Emily and like kind of what she's getting herself into. So basically Emily Wilde's encyclopedia is about Emily Wilde who is a scientist who studies Faye and she travels all over and stays extended periods of times in different parts of the world trying to understand the Faye and the Faye realm and also building relationships with the Faye so that she can glean a better understanding of their lifestyle. As we know, fae traditionally are tricksters and you have to be very careful about how you talk to them and how you make deals with them. So Emily, over the years of studying their behavior, knows this and she makes a few deals with different fae in this area because the village that she's staying in has had issues with changelings. But the issue is that the villagers don't really want to talk to Emily because Emily is very much into her work and less so into people and so she comes off as being very rude. And a lot of the villagers have an expectation of those coming and staying in their village and how they should behave. And Emily just doesn't understand this. And honestly, she doesn't really care. So Emily has a bit of tension between a lot of the villagers. And then in comes Wendell, who is Emily's academic rival at Cambridge. And when he comes into the picture, he is so charming. And he immediately understands the village people. He understands their way of living and the expectations they have for guests 
staying in the village and so he ends up charming a lot of the villagers which in turn kind of makes them a little softer towards Emily and so together they end up being able to uncover some things about the Fae but more so Emily. So I'm pretty much halfway through this book and again just really loving the dynamic between Emily and Wendell but I really like the village people as well. I think it's just funny how they interact with Emily and how she interacts with them versus how they interact with Wendell. <laughs> so I'm really hoping for the best with this one. Hello friends we have made it to the end and we have a lot to talk about because I have finished one book I DNF'd a book I voted for the Goodreads Choice Awards because I did not realize how far into December we already were and that my final chance to vote was coming up. So I didn't actually finish all of the books in time to vote, but at the rate I was going, I kind of already knew what I was gonna vote for. So we'll talk about that. And then today the Goodreads Choice Award winner for fantasy, well, all categories was announced. And I was kind of already spoiled about who won only because they announced it actually last night at like, I think, 6 p.m. my time. So I had kind of seen some things all around. I didn't realize that they had announced it at 6 p.m when it was supposed to be today. So I do know who won. We will talk about it. We'll talk about my feelings on it. First and foremost, I finished Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia for Fairies and I ended up really, really enjoying this. Unfortunately, it didn't end up making it to a four star. It is a solid 3.5 stars. This just didn't give me that four star feeling. I think this really just comes down to the plot just being like, okay. As I said before, I wasn't as invested in the investigation of the Fae despite my love for Fae and my interest in that aspect, but I was very invested in the relationships that were being built here, especially between Wendell and Emily. And that was really cute and I really liked the way that it played out. I think the ending kind of went off the rails a little bit for a second and then it came back. But I think ultimately I wished we had a little more focus on Emily and Wendell overall, which that's just a personal problem that I have because this book isn't pitched to be about them. But I really loved their banter. I really loved their relationship. I really loved the way that he taught Emily things, but also just so wholeheartedly accepted her for who she was. And she also just like accepts him for who he is and that they are extremely different, but work really well together as a team. So I enjoyed it. 3.5. It's a solid book. I definitely think that if you don't mind slow plots that are like investigations and scientific and that the romance and the banter is very good, but it's not, you know, the forefront of the book, then I think you'll have a lot of fun with this. Secondly, we already know I probably was gonna DNF this and I have. I didn't really read anymore. I was thinking about it and I was like, if I'm already feeling the vibes of DNFing, why am I gonna push myself through this? So I'm not going to. And I know that's disappointing. I wish that I would have read all of the books for the top 10, but I did get really far into this, I think. I ended up getting almost 300 pages in and I just couldn't push myself through it. And the thing is, is I think that this is a very well-written book. I think it's a good book. It's just not a book for me. And I recognize that pretty immediately. And to be fair to this book, I really liked the first like 15% of this so much. Like so much so I almost went out and bought it. I'm glad I didn't, but I just don't know if Samantha Shannon is the author for me. And that's sad because all of her books, like the premise of them, I'm always very interested in it intrigued but then I read them and I find myself not caring about anything none of the characters none of the plot and so I was just really struggling through this but I do believe that if you loved Priory of the Orange Tree and you enjoy Samantha Shannon's writing and character building and world building you're gonna absolutely love this I think that this is actually from what I remember so take this with a grain of salt this feels more well fleshed out well developed and better written than Priory of the Orange Tree and I think Samantha Shannon from what I've noticed because I did read the bone season I read the first two books in the bone season series and then I read 70% of Priory and then some of this I think each book that she puts out gets better and better. So I think that's exciting for those who really click with her work and her writing. It's not for me and that sucks, but at least I didn't push through a almost 900 page book. So those are technically the last books for this vlog. So we can already see here that like I did not have the best time and I just struggle with the Goodreads Choice Awards in general. I think this is a consensus among most people. I'm not gonna harp on it too much. There were a lot of books in the fantasy category that I'm not sure why they were in fantasy, namely 
Emily, Hellbent, Starling House, and even the unmaking of June Farrow. I question if it should have been put into fantasy. I understand why it got slotted there. I'm just not convinced that it should have been in the fantasy. There were a couple other books on this list that never made it to the top 10 that I was really hoping to see make it to the top 10 because they are pretty traditional fantasies. And that was The Will of the Many and the book that wouldn't burn. And this isn't even coming from a place of like, I'm just really excited to read them. So I wish I could have read them in this vlog, which yes, that is true. But also there were so many books in this category that I feel like could have been placed elsewhere to leave room for these more like epic fantasies. And I know fantasy is a wide genre with many sub genres. And so I love leaving room for not just epic fantasies, but even for magical realism and other things such as that. But I feel like the books that did make it into this fantasy category didn't really fit into that for me. Specifically with Hellbent and Starling House, I feel like those should have been in horror. And again, I'm not sure if it's like for continuity's sake because Ninth House was in the fantasy genre. So putting Hellbent in the fantasy genre again this year like makes sense to them, but I don't know if that's really why they did that. So that being said, the voting came and went and I ended up voting for Amina al Sarafi because nothing I've read so far has come close to my feelings about this book or how much I really enjoyed this book. But the other part of me was really hoping that I would find a new favorite book while reading these top 10 and that just didn't happen for me. So now the winner of the Goodreads Choice Awards in fantasy was Hellbent and I knew this last night because somebody had mentioned it and I was really disappointed only because if Goodreads is anything it's all about what has the most exposure and obviously Hellbent and Leigh Bardugo generally has a lot of exposure especially with their TV show coming out in the last two years so I definitely wasn't shocked but I was disappointed. And it's not actually because I did not like Hellbent, like with any fiber of my being, but more so because of what I've been saying over and over again, I just don't think that it should have been in the fantasy category. So it definitely wasn't surprised, just feeling a little bit disappointed. And funny enough, Amina al Sarafi actually didn't even make it very high on the list. Let's look at the votes. In terms of votes, it was third to last. So it got 28,274 votes. And then Swordcatcher, 30,000, Fragile Threads, 37. Bookshop and Bone Dust, I was actually surprised, had 38,000. And Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia had 38,000 and just had a few hundred more than Bookshops and Bone Dust. Samantha Shannon had 39,000. And then there's a huge jump because Trust of the Emerald Sea has 57,000, which was shocking because there is actually a huge jump as well between Trust and Hellbent because Hellbent came in with 75,800 votes. But that being said, Brandon Sanderson having 57,000 and then Samantha Shannon in third with 39, Brandon Sanderson is a huge fantasy author, which is why I figured that if Hellbent wasn't gonna win, Tress was going to win. So yeah, disappointing, not surprised. That's probably the mood for this whole video. I do hope that it was fun. Even though I didn't like love anything, I do hope that you had a fun time. I had a fun time. Even though nothing like hit the way that I wanted it to, I still had a really fun time exploring the top 10, but I hope that you had a good time. Thank you so much for joining me on this long journey. And if you've made it this far and you have nothing else to say, please leave a trophy emoji down below and I will talk to you next time. Bye friends. <laughs>